All right, so I think we're recording now. Um, yes, we are. And uh, I've got to get this out to you guys because uh, we're, uh, we're not going to meet Friday, as you know. And uh, I've got another video on, uh, on your assignment to do for Friday's class in place of it. And we do have readings due on Monday. So you'll be quizzed on those meetings that are readings that are in the syllabus on Monday. Um, but for today, yes, uh, we've got a little lecture for us. Uh, and I uh, uh, we'll want to go over that for anybody who missed it and for the Section A class that, that uh, had to cancel class today for them. So today we're talking about how our notions of gender as well as sex or sexuality or any other categories we use to understand people, right? It could be disability. It could be anything that sort of prejudices us in a sense um, can lead to dysfunctional effects. And those effects can be uh, for the family, the campus community, your company, your society. In other words, any collectivity. Um, and also, uh, we're going to be talking about our next lab assignment. Um, and it's big and it's collaborative. So people will see if you're not contributing, uh, they'll see your name there and that you haven't entered data because uh, it is, uh, we're all working on the same spreadsheet, and your name's in there already. Uh, whoever you are in, in these classes this uh, fall semester uh, 2019, your name is there. So we'll be talking about that in the next video. But on this one, this is just for the content of uh, gender stuff. So what kinds of factors cause us to have gender roles? And we can have a discussion about that, about what causes us to have different expectations of success in a role by gender, by gender. Sorry guys, I'm at the car dealership here. I'm marooned here as I, uh, as I do this, but um, hope you can hear me well enough. And um, I'm walking you through this. So this is what I would say we should note on these things. And we might talk about biological factors, uh, structural factors that give us resources, or cultural factors that uh, shape the meaning of things. And so even if I've got resources and I could be successful in that role, I've got the money, I've got the skill, um, I may not uh, want to or people might not let me because they have different understandings of what's appropriate, right? So this can be domestic labor roles or it can be career choices, um, you know, whether you think it's okay to be a nurse or uh, a, a firefighter or uh, what have you, based on your gender, or whether you think it's okay to you know, do laundry or um, uh, cut the lawn, uh, that kind of thing. So uh, some differences are linked to biological sex, but there's a question mark there because uh, we don't always know what the demands are. The demands on a role can change. What it means to mow the lawn changes, certainly, with you've got lightweight electric mowers. I mean, you don't need to be big and strong to mow the lawn. Give me a break, right? Um, but any role can also be performed differently. So don't tell me you couldn't do it in a wheelchair, frankly. Um, well, it might be challenging, but right, you, can, you can think of these things in different ways, right? There's more than one way to skin a cat. That's what goes here, more than one way to skin a cat. There's greater individual differences than group differences. Um, uh, so you've got two groups that differ, uh, but there's many more differences, there are much wider differences within the groups. Uh, than between the groups. So you can have some uh, really big, strong women, uh, bigger and stronger than, than most men. Um, and you can have some uh, delicate, frail men, more delicate and frail than most women, that, that kind of thing. Uh, not just frail, uh, skinny, so you can fit through uh, spaces and be an asset to the fire department, for example. We talked about that in class today. Anyway, um, we've mentioned it before. There's differences in structural conditions. Uh, that's the resource kind of thing. And uh, these things might constrain you, education or income, um, um, or mobility and role obligations, uh, such as women not being hired because they're seen as being perhaps uh, uh, having to stay at home for periods because of child care or nursing or something like that. And I talked to the class about how I, I've lectured with a baby uh, in, my, you know, uh, in my sling in front of my, my chest. And uh, we didn't used to think about it that way, but we can think about it differently um, as cultural meanings change. And so uh, that's one of the things that's in flux. 
So you've got structural conditions, education and income, things like that. Uh, also mobility and role obligations, but differences in cultural meanings count too, and they, they evolve too. So identities and acts are often gendered. I'll bet my dad, you know, when he was lecturing, couldn't have carried me as a baby while he lectured. It would have been too feminine. He just wouldn't have even thought of it or considered it, but now we can, and uh, um, that's, that's probably a good thing. Every man needs a truck, or every woman needs a man, used to be one, one expression. Um, but uh, those things change. Otherwise, we find discrimination. If they don't ch change, what we find is that we're short-sighted and we're keeping people out of uh, positions that they could perform well. It can happen, discrimination by individuals. It's just based on their thoughts and their feelings, their decisions. They think they may be doing the right thing or there's just there's something that doesn't feel right about it. Or institutions where it's a matter of policy and procedure. That's just the way it's set up. Uh, and uh, there's norms, ways of doing things that end up discriminating against uh, uh, women or men, for example. Um, but uh, that's a general pattern. Now, degendering, though, is a trend. Make that flash for us. That's right. It's a trend, right? So it doesn't necessarily uh, think so many things don't have to be gendered. Um, and we're beginning to loosen up in terms of how we, we think about them. Um, maybe I should wear a, wear a dress to class uh, because it's cooler or something. Um, or makeup because it makes my eyes pop or something. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I ought to put that on the quiz to make sure you're watching this stuff. You'd remember that, right? Uh, okay, anyway. Um, why would degendering be a trend? Because our awareness of this effect there, that any role can be performed differently, right? Our awareness of that effect is what helps us grow, right? So if we go into a situation thinking that, ah, I don't know the, way, the best way to do things here necessarily, I should be open to other ways, you'll, you'll get improvements in how things are done. And society will do better. And uh, our society will do better. Not to mention the fact that it gives people the right to pursue their own potential, regardless of your expectations of how well they can do. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next thing. For example, in terms of discrimination, this is an example of discrimination by institutions and by individuals. And Rosabeth Moss Cantor was a sociologist, I believe, at the University of Michigan, and uh, she was hired by IBM to research why there weren't more women getting to the upper levels of their corporation as executives. They were hiring them on executive tracks, but why weren't more women getting up there? Um, and so they, they couldn't figure it out. They, they had the, the, uh, the ability for them to, to um, get promoted, but it appeared they were hitting a glass ceiling, as she put it. And that's where you have invisible barriers to promotion. Uh, her interviews found a pattern of homophily, interviewing men often on why they weren't promoting certain women, um, and it was usually men that they're, they're talking to. They talked about uh, preferences for similarity. They talked about trust and fit. Well, I didn't really trust her as much. Well, I didn't think she'd fit in as much. And that predicted whether or not they'd be seriously considered for a promotion. And it also predicted their inclusion or exclusion from social networks. Um, and this is really the beginning of the old boys network uh, uh, terminology. Uh, it's, it's her finding that led to that. And uh, a bunch of old boys, and they've got a network. And if you're not part of that network, you're not going to be included. And they're not going to include you, or you're not going to be promoted. And they're not going to include you if they think they can't trust you or you wouldn't fit in. Now, if we think about sort of why that is, we could have a discussion on this in class today we did, uh, it's easier to, tra to talk to people that are similar to you. You feel like they'll understand you more. Uh, but if we think about what makes trust, you know, how do we develop trust over time, um, and maybe what makes relationships, you know, can we have a comfortable relationship with somebody? we discover that, well, when you really think about it, yeah, you can. You can have a comfortable relationship with just about anybody, provided you interact with them over time. And you, you have that interaction time to build up a sense of 
shared information and understanding about what they're about, what they like, what they dislike, um, and you grow to trust them. And so what Cantor argues, and many, many have since argued, is that we should focus on the job, on the actual requirements, and forget about trust and fit and those vague feelings of whether you like somebody or not, right? You'll grow to like them, right? You can grow to like just about anybody, right? Um, and especially if they can do the job. So now there's another, another pattern that they find, which is, this is after Cantor. Uh, I don't know how much longer, I forget. I think, I mean, you saw it in your textbook. I think it's like 15, 20 years after Cantor. They found the glass escalator, and I love it. I love it, it partly because it's, uh, it's good for the, the guys in the crowd or the white folks in the crowd, you know, to think of how you've been privileged in this way. And you can even things out by just showing that, hey, you know, I, you know, I know you've got your stuff and you may have been disadvantaged, but I'm just going to say I'm, I'm becoming aware of how I've been advantaged. So I'm, you know, I'm, I hope I'm doing my part, and in part, it's one of the things we can do as privileged, overprivileged people who have unearned, dis unearned advantages, show we know about the glass escalator. So we know that, say, there have been studies of men in female-dominated occupations who have been lifted up, right? OK, so here's what happens. The, the, these studies find that at the institutional level, there are visible various barriers to promotion. They shouldn't be promoted from up, you know, from uh, out of being a children's librarian suddenly into administration for all the libraries of the city, right? Or going from a kindergarten teacher to a principal. That shouldn't really happen, but it's much more likely to happen if you're a man, for example, and doesn't, you don't appear to fit in those other occupations where it's mostly women, as children's librarians, for example, or, or um, elementary school teachers. Um, so at the individual level, what's happening is that there's invisible assistance based on a feel for who fits, a feel for who fits. So you got to avoid that kind of uh, sensibility in using those criteria. Um, that's that's the glass escalator, everybody. Sorry. So just ending on, on that. Darn it. Got to skip there. But yeah, that's the end of that. Okay. Uh, now go to the next video, and uh, you'll find out about the lab assignment.